ladies and gentlemen, you are getting ready to embark on what I would refer to as one of the most important labs in our program. Not just our course, but our entire program. What? Yes, that's how important this laboratory technique is. The purpose of this class is proper wet laboratory technique. That means we want to ensure that you are using things the proper way when you use them. And one of the most important pieces of glassware that we have in a laboratory environment is something called a volumetric pipette. Pipit. I mean, if you want to sound French, I mean, that's how the way you could say it. I'm not going to judge. Okay, so let's take a look at a volumetric pipit. All right. Volumetric pipettes are used to measure volumes. Well, there's a lot of different things that can be used to measure volumes in a lab. We have something like a beaker. We have something like a graduated cylinder. We have things that we call e-flask or what we call Erlenmeyer flask. And all of these are trashy. All of these are nasty, trashy pieces of glassware that we do not want to use in a real working laboratory. I mean, beakers are great to drink like things like coffee out of. Okay, graduated cylinders are perfectly fine if you're in high school. Erlenmeyer flask, well, don't get me started on Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, well, maybe they're not that trashy. I mean, there's markings on them for a reason, isn't there? And the answer is yes. I know, I know. Graduated cylinders do measure about, that's the key word, about the volume that you see. Beakers measure about the volume that you see. Erlenmeyer flask measure about the volume that you see. But if a doctor or a nurse came into your hospital room while you were in there prepping for surgery or getting out of surgery, they're prescribing you medication, they're giving you anesthesia, and they're going to say, well, we know about the amount that we want to give you. How would that make you feel? Would you trust them? So why would you do any different in a lab? So you never want to be about. You want to be on target. You want to be precise and you want to be accurate. That's the key word. Precision, you want to be able to do the same thing over and over and over and over the right way. And accurate means that you want to make sure that you get the right answer each and every time. So beakers and graduated cylinders and Irma or flask, they begin to complicate things for us up a little bit. So we do use these, don't get me wrong. When these volumes are not critical, we do use these pieces of glassware. That's perfectly okay. But when I begin to really make solutions for real and do some data analysis, not just synthesis or observational type of work. I want to make sure that I'm as accurate as possible, and these are not going to cut it. All right, so prices of beakers, a lot of people just have no clue. Beakers down here at the bottom, you're going to see $150 for a pack of 12 on average. Graduated cylinders, $330 for a pack of 12. And Erlenmeyer flask, we're looking at $100 for a pack of 12. Those give you prices of each one of these. So no one said that laboratory was cheap. And if you just look at these three pieces of glassware, you can imagine what type of money is, is basically invested into a well-stocked laboratory. Our laboratory right now, currently, we have over $20,000 just in beakers and Erlenmeyer flask and graduated cylinders. Crazy! I mean, does somebody want to write me another check for $20,000? Because if so, I'll cash out and I'll retire early. All right, so volumetric pipettes are another piece of this glassware. And volumetric pipettes are highly accurate, folks. Highly, highly, highly accurate. That's why we use them. These volumetric pipettes are going to be your best friends. Now, I put best in quotes right up here at the top. And the reason is because you will hate them. You will hate them because you will use them, and they will tattle on your imperfections. And we will know that just by looking at your numbers. 
So it's very, very important that we learn how to use these volumetric pipettes the right way. So there's two different types. There's class A and there's class B. And class A is like a letter grade. A, the star students of the class, and that's going to be you. I know it's going to be you. And B is the lower grade quality. You know, you got so close to an A, but I'm going to give you a B instead. You're not as quality as the A students. That's kind of mean, isn't it? Well, there's two different versions of volumetric pipettes. There's class A and class B. Class A is the best. Class A is the most precise. Class A will give you the most accurate numbers that you can get from a pipette. These are required for employers. Class B, though, people knew that you needed volumetric pipettes, maybe not for employers, but for academics. So the academic institutions were able to use Class Bs. It gives you the same type of training. It gives you the same kind of usage for a volumetric pipette. But these are much, much cheaper. Okay, well, not in the Chemtech lab. We do things for real. So if employers are going to use Class A, you better believe that we're going to be using Class A. And that's what we have in stock in our laboratory. And that's what we have in stock in your lab drawers because you will see those volumetric pipettes that are located there. Now the issue with volumetric pipettes is that we could have viscous solutions. Viscous means thick. Honey is very viscous. Very, very thick. Well, honey is not going to be able to go up into these volumetric pipettes that well. So when we talk about volumetric pipettes, we're talking about aqueous solutions. We're talking about solutions that can be sucked up very well, that flow very easily. Nothing is thick like honey would be because that's not going to go up into the pipette very well. We've got to do that a different way. Volumetric pipettes, look at the price tags here, folks. $215 for a pack of 12. That makes them about $18 a piece. In our laboratory, we have all sizes from graduated, meaning 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15, 25, 50, and 100 mil volumetric pipettes. If you take the price tag or just our volumetric pipettes only, you're looking at over $10,000 of investment in volumetric pipettes. That's how many we have. As far as the pipettes go, there's different types of volumetrics in a way. But this is a confusing part of the field because volumetric pipettes are really, in purple right here, are single volume pipettes. Meaning, there is a pipette that's stamped with 10 mils. That pipette's 10 mils. Nothing more, nothing less. That is what we call a volumetric. They are specific to the volume that is stamped on the piece of glass. A 3 mil pipette will measure 3 mils exactly. It will not go above. It will not go below. But there's other types of pipettes that we often use in a lab as well. And this is what's confusing to some of the people that's never worked in a lab before. So we often have this thing called a Pasteur pipette. If you want to say it that way, say it that way. Pasteur. I'm not, again, going to judge. So these Pasteur pipettes will not be used to measure volumes. Think of these are just really big, large dropper bottles. That's what they are. They suck up solution. You might see a little bit of graduated tick marks onto the side, but folks, they don't mean squat. Okay, do not use these plastic Pasteur pipettes to measure volumes with. They are not going to be accurate. They're probably one of the least accurate things that we use in our lab. So it's great for transfers. It's great for sucking up solution and squirting it on others. But you never want to use these for a full-blown volumetric pipette. We often have graduated pipettes. There's probably one in your lab drawer. These graduated pipettes, they have a special name, and that name is called a Moore, M-O-H-R, a Moore pipette. 
they are not as accurate as volumetrics. Okay, they are graduated, which means that I can measure out things like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. That's great. But because they are graduated, because they deliver multiple different volumes, the calibrations cannot be as guaranteed as what's on a strict volumetric pipette. So they're great pipettes, don't get me wrong. We do use them often if we need fractions of a milliliter, but more pipettes do not carry the accuracy that a volumetric pipette does. So you do have a more pipette probably in your lab drawer. Again, take a look at it when you go in, when you do this lab, and you probably will find it there. In order to get all of these things to work, volumetric pipettes or more pipettes, you need a pipette bulb here, folks. There's different versions of a pipette bulb. Some people like one version better over another. It's just really a matter of personal preference. Okay, don't hurt the pipette bulb's fillings because you won't hurt the pipette bulb's fillings. If you do not like that pipette bulb, you look at that bulb and you say, I hate you, and you put it back into the drawer and you get another one. No one will know unless you scream it out really loud. Okay? So all of the glass pipettes need a bulb. And these bulbs are typically made out of some type of rubber material. Well, we have different versions of these in our laboratory. Version A that you see over here to the left this version is a really tiny dropper. And these are for our really tiny, small glass transfer pipettes. These are not volumetrics. They are not mores. It's just basically a long-stemmed piece of glass that we can use as a dropper. So we have those. You might see those laying around in different cradles throughout the lab. Uh, if you do, that's what we use them for. What you see for B is more of a mechanical sucking device. So some people really like these. So the volumetric pipette will actually be attached down here at the bottom. And you'll take your thumb and you'll dial this up. Spin, 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 spin. And this top piece will go up and that creates the suction to suck up the liquid into the glass pipette that you will be using. We do have these. A lot of people do not use them, but we do have them in our lab drawers. For part C, this is a traditional standard rubber bulb, basically, that we use on pipettes. So there's three different channels here that you need to be aware of. Uh, the first channel is up here at the very top, and that first channel is the air sucker. Okay, so I'm going to squeeze that piece, and then I'm going to squeeze the bulb, and then I let the top piece go, and that has trapped air inside of that bulb. That is my sucking device, okay? Well, I'm then going to place this pipette, and you can see that here at the bottom, into my solution, and there's going to be an S that's going to be right here. So I'm going to push the S. And the S means suck. So that pipette is going to suck liquid up into the chamber. And I let go of the S when that pipette is full. And then there's going to be an E. And the E means empty. Empty it out. So the E stands for empty. I'm going to push the E to dispose of the liquid in the pipette into my container that I want it to go in. These are the bulbs that most people gravitate toward. The problem is that these channels, if you do not get very good ones, will go out over time, and we're always constantly replacing them. So if you see these three channels, they're great. People have more control over the pipette when they use them. The problem is that they get damaged very easily, and we have to constantly throw them away. And they're more expensive than our simple run-of-the-mill one directional bulb so that basically your hand is the sucker you squeeze the bulb at the top you put the pipette into the solution you slowly let the bulb off it slowly sucks the liquid up into the 
the volumetric pipette, and then you pop the bulb off when you want it to dispense. That's what we have the most of, and that's probably what you will find in your lab drawer. What you see over in D are automated pipette bulbs. So you see two triggers that are right here. That's where your fingers would go. Uh, here is where the pipette would go. And one of the triggers will suck up the pipette, and the other trigger will empty the pipette. We do not have these, and the reason is because they're so darn expensive. They're hundreds and hundreds of dollars a piece for a really good one. Well, because we're talking about Class A and Class B, it also gives me a good time to tell you about different glass types that you might see in a laboratory. So the glass that we use, glass is typically made of silicon dioxide, SiO2, basically sand. It's just sand that's ordered up in a different way. Well, the glassware that we use and the glassware that you might have in your kitchen, if you do a lot of baking, would be Pyrex. And Pyrex, it used to have boron, but no longer. It's now a tempered, what we call soda lime. So this Pyrex glass will have a strong tendency to not break. So if I put it under very hot temperatures, that glass is not going to shatter on me. And that's a very good thing, not only for your oven, but it's also a very good thing for a laboratory, as you can imagine. And this is the majority of the glass that is sold to today's consumer. So if you go to Home Goods, Target, Walmart, any type of store, TJ Maxx, whatever, and you go into the cooking aisle and you see all of these glassware baking dishes, that glass is probably Pyrex that they are selling to you. So, made of sodium carbonate and made of lime, which is calcium hydroxide, that's what soda lime is, soda, sodium carbonate and calcium hydroxide. They mix it with the SiO2 and it just strengthens that glass a little bit more. You can heat these things to over 1500 degrees, all right? Borosilicate glass is actually the glass that we often use in a laboratory. It is the most thermal resistant, meaning Pyrex is great, but borosilicate is even better. And quite honestly, for us as a laboratory, there's not a major price difference in the borosilicate glass versus the Pyrex glass. So the most thermal resistant, it does not shrink, it does not enlarge based on temperatures, that I put it in, whether it's in the freezer or whether it's in the oven or a flame. And these volumetric pipettes are typically going to be borosilicates. That's just how we order them. And they come to us that way, and that's how they're stocked. Again, the Pyrex, if you're unfamiliar because you've never baked in your entire life because your mama and daddies did it for you, this is what Pyrex is. So you will see it stamped over everything and my advice to you is go buy some Pyrex today and try to cook something for yourself. You know, make yourself proud and you'll make your family proud too if you've never done that before. Okay, so let's kind of take a look at prices here. Uh, here's Fisher brand disposable borosilicate glass pasture pipettes. All right, we normally order these in cases of 1440. Uh, $154.80. Right up here at the top is what these guys look like. Okay, remember I told you these are not volumetrics. These are transfer pipettes. They are only made to suck up solution and dispense it into something else. Well, that case of over 1000 runs me about $154 a piece. That makes them less than $0.10. Cents. $0.10 cents a piece on a very good day. So these are typically one-time use. When we use them to transfer a solution with, we typically trash them. And we put them in our glass trash cans, not our regular trash cans. So pretty important they are just for maintenance, so that way they do not cut themselves on these little bitty tips of pieces of glass that are going to be pointing out of a trash bag. All right, so that gives you an idea of maybe a different type of pipette, a transfer pipette that we use in the lab. A couple of other things about volumetric pipettes. You will either see TD or TC. All right, so TD means to deliver and TC means to contain. Now, the pipettes that we use 
are always going to be TDs. And you can see that on the stamp. So down here at the bottom left-hand corner, you're going to see a piece of glassware, and it is stamped with information. That information is going to give typically the supplier name, the size of the volumetric pipette, 10 mils this time, and TD means to deliver at 20 degrees Celsius. So that is telling me that this volumetric pipette will to deliver, will deliver, okay, 10 mils plus or minus 0 0.02. So plus or minus 0 0.02, take 0 0.02 away from 10, you get 9.98. And you take 0 0.02 and you add it to 10, and you get 10.02. So this gives me a range. This means that if I use this volumetric pipette the proper way, the volume that I will deliver will be 9.98 to 10.02 every single time. The problem that people have, though, is that to deliver means to deliver. So over here on the right-hand side, you are seeing a picture of what the bottom of the pipette will look like when you use it for the first time. You will see some liquid that will be left behind. That liquid does not get removed. Never, ever, ever blow it out. If the pipette is stamped as TD, to deliver, it will deliver the proper amount that it should deliver. And in this volumetric, this basic bottom tip, that stays. Do not take your mouth and put it on the pipette and blow it out of there. Do not take your bulb and put it onto the top of the pipette and blow it out of there. It is meant to stay in there. The TCs, the two contains, you do blow these out because it contains that volume. It doesn't deliver that volume. So if it contains that volume and there's stuff that's left behind, you do need to get that out of there and you do blow those out. But we do not order those. We do not lock those and normal companies do not use them or lock them either. As far as tolerance goes, how much wiggle room do you have? Well, class A, there's, I see class A, that's why A is up there at the top. This class A will give me a tolerance, and that tolerance is always a plus or minus, just like we've spoke about before. The tolerances will change depending on the size of the pipette. As you can imagine, really small volumes should have smaller tolerance limits. Larger volumes will have larger tolerance limits. The thing with class B is that the errors are doubled. If I have a class B pipette in the laboratory and I use that compared to someone with a class A, my delivery will be twice as bad because the error that's associated with the glass is twice as bad. So for instance, a class A 50 mil volumetric has a 0 0.05 window, super, super tight. I mean, you will be delivering 50 mils with that volumetric. The class B though, that class B has double the limit. So that has a cushion of plus or minus 0.1. So you might not deliver 50 mils. You might be delivering 49.9 mils instead. And believe it or not, that could make a very large difference in a lab. Or I could be delivering 50.1. Again, that could make a difference in the lab. If you want to look at beakers, remember I said they're trashy. Trashy beakers. Those have errors that are plus or minus 5%. So that means 100 mils. That could deliver 95. It could deliver 98. It could deliver 100. It could deliver 103. It could deliver 104. It could deliver 105 at the 100 mil mark. See the problem with them now? And these things are very important in a lab when we talk about them. Again, if I zoom in on the label of the volumetric pipette, this is what you'll see. There's the stamp. It says 10 mils. I see the A that's also stamped on there. That A is to the side, so that tells me this is a Class A volumetric. This is meant to deliver 10 milliliters of volume. So this is a TD volumetric pipette, which means it will deliver that 10 mils. I do not blow it out. And then they give me a time stamp. 
that time stamp is a calibration technique. That means that if I fill this volumetric pipette up to the line, and right here is the etched line, over to the left, I see that brown line right up there at the top. It should deliver that 10 milliliters within 25 seconds. Folks, this is the stuff that people take for granted. Even if you've used a volumetric pipette before, this is the stuff that people take for granted because they never look at what's stamped on the volumetric. So even the time interval, how long does it take for this pipette to deliver that amount of substance, is stamped and recorded on the piece of glass. So within 25 seconds, normally at room temperature, a little bit lower, 20 degrees, I should see all of that volume out of the pipette at that point. Here's a table. Don't really have to take anything away from the table other than looking at the errors for class A and compare it to class B. Notice in every line item, the class B error has been doubled. And that is why we do not use class Bs. Great for academic labs because you still get pretty close to the volume that you need. But folks, we want to be even better than that. We want really, really good numbers that a lab in industry would provide as well. So we always order class A even though they are a little bit more expensive. Another thing that happens with these volumetric pipettes typically come with a C of A, and that stands for a Certificate of Accuracy. So basically, this is a piece of paper, and it says, we just sold you a piece of glassware called a pipette. And what we sold you was a 10 milliliter volumetric pipette. And we tested this volumetric pipette out for you before you purchased it from us. And our average was a 10.011 mils. And our standard deviation was a 0 0.003. Okay, so 10 mils, and there's the error that's associated with the 10 mils. So let me go back to this chart. Here's 10 mils. And if I go over, there is the tolerance limit, 0 0.02. Well, this certificate says 0 0.003. That's way, way lower. So they are well within the Class A requirement. Not only that, but it tells me the error limit that's on the certificate as well. It's right there, 0 0.02. Folks, a lot of laboratories will keep this. This is their proof that they ordered a tested, calibrated piece of glassware in their laboratory. And don't be surprised if they actually put serial numbers on these volumetric pipettes either, just to keep track of them even more. It depends on what type of lab that you work for and what kind of hurdles they have to go through as far as regulatory purposes go. So here's a picture of a volumetric, and you will see a number that's typically stamped right here if that's what they've ordered. And this allows them to make sure that they use the same type of pipette for the same method over and over and over. It just streamlines and makes the data a little bit better. So now that we are familiar with what's stamped on the volumetric pipette, let's take a look at how to use the volumetric pipette the proper way. So I'm going to go through these directions. Just bear with me just for a second, just so I can make sure that we touch base on everything. So number one, draw the liquid above the top graduation with a pipetting aid. So this would be something like a pipetting bulb. So there's going to be a mark up at the top of the pipette. That is the level at which you want to go. You want to to go above that level. You want to go above that mark. The reason is you're going to have to take the bulb off. When you take the bulb off, that's going to start the draining process and you need to put your finger on top of it. So there's going to be a slight moment in time where you will be draining some of that liquid out of the pipette before you get your thumb on it. So that's why we always tell you go a little bit over. Do not. Do not suck up so much that it goes into the bulb because then you will ruin the bulb and you never want to do that. Number two, wipe off any liquid on the outside 
with a soft cloth or a tissue like a chem wipe, and you're going to see those at your lab stations. Use the forefinger, not the thumb. Well, if it makes you feel good, use your thumb, right? If it makes you feel good, do it that way. I'm not going to scream. Nobody's going to scream at you. I use my thumb because I think it's a little bit easier to control. Other people use their forefinger, their pointy finger. If you want to use your middle finger, use your middle finger. Just don't point it at me. But you're going to use a finger, I don't care which one, to control the delivery and make sure that the solution goes down to that etched line at the start place. Next, hold the pipette vertically and drain it with the tip touching the inner wall of the receiving container. So some people just stick it in the middle and they just dispose of everything in the middle. They never touch that piece of glass. That's okay, but you might have a droplet or two that sticks to the outside of that volumetric pipette. Well, that droplet or two made its way out of the pipette, which means that it should be included in the weight and the volume of the delivery. So that's why they tell you to touch the inner walls, because that ensures that any residual drop or drops will come off of the tip and down into that solution. It says, after having emptied the pipette, draw it upwards along the inner wall of the container to remove any of that extra liquid that was on the outside. And then, do not remove the tip with strong motion. Residual liquid that's still present in the tip has to be left there. Okay, that's, in other words, don't yank it. Don't just grab a hold of it and act like a crazy person in the lab and yank it straight up as fast as you can because that's going to sling some of that extra liquid out of the pipette if you're not careful. So here are the motions. The pipette goes down into the solution. You suck the solution up to the appropriate level and you keep it there. And this person, I guess, chose to suck it up to that point. Then we'll take a chem wipe and we'll wipe the outside of this off because there's some residual liquid that's there that doesn't need to be transferred and delivered. Then there is the starting amount that I need to deliver. And then that pipette will go into another container. And here it's an Erlenmeyer flask. And notice they stuck the tip onto the sides of the wall and they delivered that solution into that container. All right, so there's the appropriate method, the technique that you will be using today. The meniscus is very important. The meniscus is basically this curvy piece, okay? And that curvy piece is called the meniscus. And the bottom of that curvy piece is the readout. So over here on the diagram, you basically see the meniscus that looks like this. Do not read from the top of that meniscus. You always read from the bottom of that meniscus when you deliver volumes and when you measure volumes. So that's how we read the solvent line. Reading proper volumetrics, here's another diagram. This volumetric is delivered or divided, I should say, into 0.1 increments. And right here is the volume. Okay, so this volume, the way it is, there's the 3 mark. And this is a 0.1 and a 0.2. So that means that the volume that's in this container right now is 3.2. I'm reading the bottom of the meniscus, not the top. So do not report 3 because that's where the top is at. No, 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 no. You do the bottom of the meniscus whenever you read volumes. Other types of pipettes, you will see things that are called serological pipettes. These are to deliver. Sorry, these are to contain, not to deliver. That's a mistake. I caught that mistake. Shame on me. And, of course, the volumetrics, which are TDs, and, of course, the Moors, which are also TDs. Believe it or not, there is a standard method that a laboratory has to go through in order to prove that their volumetric pipettes work the proper way. And this is coming from the American Society of Testing and Material, abbreviated as ASTM. And over on the right-hand side, you're going to see the different lab procedures that some people will have to do 
just to ensure that the volumetric pipette is working the proper way. So for instance, E969, standard specification for volumetric pipettes. And then E1044, standard specification for glass serological pipettes. And then E288, standard specification for lab glass volumetric flask. E694, standard specification for lab glass on a volumetric apparatus. Folks, you can imagine the headache that comes along with just glassware. And again, a lot of people take this for granted. But folks, that's the purpose of this class. It's to take something that you might have been exposed to in the past and tell you there's more to it. There's more to it. There's more details that go along with this. A real working laboratory operates in a different way than normally what general chemistry shows you. And that's the purpose of this class. So the good news here is that candidates with bachelor's degree in chemistry sometimes never have used a volumetric pipette before. Can you believe that? I mean, that just blows my mind. I don't really understand how someone can go through four years of a chemistry-based program and have never picked up a volumetric pipette. But here in our very first class that you're probably taking in our program or one of the first, you are getting ready to use a tool in one of the very first weeks of our class that some bachelor's degree candidates will never have the experience to use. And now you know even more about them. Not only do you know it's a volumetric pipette, but folks, just take a look at the stamping on the volumetric pipette. A lot of people don't have a clue that all of that information is on there ready for them to be used as a reference. So in this lab procedure, what you will do is that you will go through and you will uh, measure out different volumes using a volumetric pipette. You will get the masses of those deliveries, and then you will report those masses to an instructor. And that instructor will double check and cross reference and AOK you out of that sector. What that means is that let's say my first, my first section tells me to deliver 10 milliliters. It's going to tell me to deliver 10 milliliters multiple times. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to get a mass of each one of these, and then I will average these out. Okay, then I'm going to take this data to an instructor, and I'm going to have them to check those values. Because chances are we cannot be there and watch you use the volumetric pipette, not every single time. And by looking at your values, we will know if you use the volumetric pipette the proper way or not. Because we know what the target should be. We know the window, the wiggle room that's allowed on the volumetric. And we want to make sure that you are within that window. If not you might be asked to go back and to deliver again. So it's very important that you take your time. It's very important that you make sure the meniscus is at the bottom of that line and not half-ass do it. You want to make sure that you don't go too much above or too much below. That's a problem for us. It will show up in your data, and we will ask you to go back and do it again if that's the case. So you've just wasted time, double time now, where if you just took your time in the beginning, took it a little slow, was really careful with it, you could have passed it the first time around. So once you pass that 10 milliliter volume, then you'll go back to the lab and you might take a stab at the five milliliter if that's what we ask you to deliver. And then you'll check that set of data and then you'll move on to the next section. And maybe that's a one milliliter. I don't know. I'm just making these numbers up. You'll do the one milliliter multiple times and then you'll check your data and then you'll keep moving on throughout the experiment that way. Part B of this lab experiment is going to now test you on making a solution. So what will happen is that you will have two solutions here. I'm going to call it solution one and solution two. And we will have you to make four or five mixes. 
So it will give me the milliliters that I need of this one and the milliliter that I need of that one. And I combine them into a container and I give them a really good mix. These have to be pipetted. Then I do the same thing here, same thing for three, same thing for four, and same thing for five. So if I've used the volumetrics the right way and I've read the table the proper way, I've made these five solutions and these solutions are going to be ran on a piece of equipment. I'm not worried about the piece of equipment right now. I don't want you to know the details of that piece of equipment. But that piece of equipment will give you readout values. And what you want to see here is if you did your job the right way, we are going to plot this data. And this data should be a very straight line. We know if it's a straight line because we will be looking at a R squared value. This is called a correlation coefficient. It lets me know how well you prepared these solutions. If it should be a straight line, this R squared value should be a 1. That's perfect. The closer you are to 1, the better job you did. So at the very end of this, when you get the hang of using a volumetric, we'll have you to go make a set of five real solutions, and those solutions will be ran on a piece of equipment, and that piece of equipment will tattle on you whether or not you made those five solutions the proper way. And that's how we'll end the lab. So it's all about using the volumetric pipette the proper way. That's what this is about. Nothing more, nothing less. All right, folks, so have fun in the lab, right? I know this stuff can be very boring in the beginning. I, I, I admit that. However, we are leading you up to more appropriate methods. And before we can do that, we have to ensure that you can do the basics like this first. If you can't do the basics like this, then you can't do the more advanced labs that you might have a little bit more fun doing later on in the semester. All right, so good luck with the volumetrics, and we'll see you in the laboratory.